Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay, I'm Astrid, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, and just thanks, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate it. It's beautiful to see this room full after such a, I don't know, we've had such a low, and then poof, God is good. God's really good. And so... This is an AA meeting, and our format's a little bit different. You know, sometimes it's like, I don't know, throw a dart or pick something out of the hat or the black print or, I don't know, a purple hat or, um, you know, one paragraph or one line or, you know, tag a friend. And ours talks about alcoholism, ego, and self. And when we talk about alcoholism, ego, and self, the ego part... We incorporate the Harry Tebow papers, and Harry Tebow's talked about in the back of the big book. He won the Lasker Award for having the American Medical Association actually recognize alcoholism as a disease instead of, like, you know, some kind of uh, moral issue. And so then, I mean, if ever you've had your insurance pay for you to spin dry somewhere in Camp Snoopy, you can thank Harry Tebow for that. And you can thank him for so many other things along the way. And he was a psychiatrist in the, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s who studied alcoholics sober, and he could not figure it out. And he had very, very little success in hospitals. And, you know, and he'd lay him on the couch, and he'd... Ask them what's wrong with their childhood, what's wrong with their life, were they spanked, were they not potty trained, were they not nurtured enough, and he kept trying to dig at these root causes, or they'd come in and they'd say, my wife is going to leave me, and, and so, the, you know, he'd pretty much threaten, hey, you're going to lose your whole family, and we all know now that none of those things really work. I have to get down to causes and conditions, and I have to really, really see the disease for what it is, which is a mental obsession coupled with a physical allergy. So this physical allergy aspect, I'm going to guess that you wouldn't be here tonight unless you were actually allergic to alcohol. Six percent of the population in the world are allergic to alcohol. What does that mean? That means I take a drink and I trigger the phenomena of craving and then I can't stop. I can't stop. And I do pitiful and incomprehensible things. I'm telling you, I run around and then I get drugs and I lose my underwear and I suck a bunch of dick and I break out in handcuffs and I lie and cheat and steal and I don't show up and I just wander out into the streets and I never come back again. You have no idea where I'm going to wind up when it's beer 30. It's not a joke. And I might take a bunch of people down with me. You don't want to be on that train. It's not pretty. But you see, the first time I ever drank, it wasn't like that. I didn't have that. I think I drank like two beers and maybe threw up and went home and thought, I don't want to do that anymore. I did not cross over the invisible line the first night. And I'm talking about my life and I'm talking about my experience. Some people say they did cross over the invisible line. What I've come to understand studying alcoholism as a medical issue and as a disease is that at first what happens is usually the alcoholic, and I'm going to speak for myself, got something out of drinking, and I enjoyed it, and it did something for me. I got a rise out of it, and it quieted something, or it made me more gregarious, or I could open my legs, you know, or I could hit on somebody, or I even played better pool. I even used to think I would drive better. I thought I was a better writer. I thought I was more artistic. The crazy things I would think, you know, in the beginning, drinking alcohol. And um, then eventually what happened was I drank, and I drank, and I drank, and I drank, and I drank. And it didn't do for me what it used to do, and on top of it, I lost the freedom of choice. And now I can't stop. And so now I'm a slave to the thing. And I don't really know what's wrong with me, because even when I was growing up and I was an alcoholic, by the time I was 18, I was definitely a full-blown alcoholic. I, I was not exposed to this information. People didn't tell me that I'd crossed over an invisible line and I had the phenomenon of craving inside of my body and I had a physical allergy that was so subtly powerful that it was going to wildly, blindly drive me into the gates of insanity. And so for most of us, including me, I wake up every morning with a horrible hangover. My head is splitting. And in case you don't know or don't remember, alcohol is also a depressant. And I want to fucking kill myself. And I hate my life. And I hate everyone. And I'm so ashamed of what I said. And I'm so ashamed of what I did. And I swear to God, as I'm laying in bed with my heart, my head pounding, I'm never going to fucking do this again. i got to get out of this. i got to stop this. And by 5 o'clock every afternoon, I'm change my mind. But I don't really change my mind. 
the disease changes my mind because the main part of the disease centers in my mind and I'm a meat puppet for a mind-powered disease. And it ain't a fucking joke. And if I don't know what's wrong with me, I'm just going to come in here and what? I don't know. Hang out and loiter with the intent to recover? Get the coolest sponsor? Get another fucking $40,000 big book? Go to the right meeting? Sit around the right people? I mean, I'm telling you, the book says I have to be armed with the facts. What are the facts? Armed with what facts? Well, to me, that's a really big fact. It's a huge fact. So it's not just like some mild thing like, oh, yeah, I'm allergic, you know, I have the phenomenal craving. I want to know that for the rest of my life, and I don't want to ever forget, I even smell Purell when someone's doing something with their hand stuff, and I swear to God, something happens inside of my mouth and my throat, and my whole body perks up, and it's like I smell my dope. I smell my dope. You smell it? I smell the Purell. Uh, just from the alcohol in the Purell, I have a physical, reaction to fucking Purell. You know what? Most people are like, I don't know, that's hand sanitizer. What's the matter with you? So here we go. Now, I want to look at the, uh, the brain chemistry of this phenomenon of craving. It's called the reward system. So at one point, in the reward system, I got a reward, and now I don't get a reward anymore. I get hell, but the reward system is still there, and it smells liquor, or it sees it, or it's reminded of something, and then it wants liquor. So in AA, we say, you got to get rid of everything. you got to change everything. You can't go to slippery places. Don't have, your, you know, old friends, the old neighborhoods, you know. And what I've come to realize is that everything can become a trigger for a hardcore alcoholic. Like, I just look down at my shoes. I hear a certain song. I drive by a certain street because the main part of the disease centers in my mind. So the phenomenon of craving isn't that I'm salivating for liquor. It's that my mind says, I think we need to check out or remember what we used to do. And so I'm driven by this thing. And the urge isn't so enormous until I pour liquor on it. The real full-blown phenomenon of craving doesn't happen until I, until I pour alcohol on it. But the mind is constantly getting reminded. And if I don't babysit that part of the mind, I'm going to wind up physically salivating for liquor, and I'm going to wind up drinking. 2% of alcoholics ever stay sober for five years. Alcoholics Anonymous, we might even say, is somewhat of a failure of a program. Why are there millions of members and so few old-timers? I saw Shelly take a cake last year. She said something that scared the shit out of me. She's like, I'm 23, 24 years sober. She says, I'm closer to a drink now because how many people are 24 years sober? There's not very many in my league. And I was like, man, that shit hit me in the stomach. It scared the shit out of me when she said that. Because I keep thinking as I get further and further that I'm going to get further and further away from a drink. I'm safer and safer. But you know what? Maybe there's some truth to what she said. Maybe I'm not safer and safer. Maybe all I have is a daily repeat contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition, and every day is the day I must carry the vision of God's will for me into all my activities. And if I don't look at my mental activities, I'm going to get screwed. So back to Harry Tebow. He talked about this infantile ego. And he said that I'm grandiose and I'm omnipotent and I have an infantile ego. Which basically means I'm a big fucking baby and you can't say no to me. And I get frustrated really easily and don't fucking get in my face or try to take anything away from me. And certainly don't try to stop me. Oh, no. Oh, fucking no. Don't you dare try to stop me. Don't you say no to me. Don't you even say no to me about kicking the homeless people out of this meeting. Don't you say no to me, you know. And my ego is not my amigo. And I will be driven by that to the point of insanity, to the point of unreasonableness. And it bends and it skews my glasses to the point where I can't see things clearly. I can't have a real wholesome experience because I'm driven by my warped instincts. My instinct and my infantile ego are woven together. They are, they are Siamese twins along with my untreated alcoholism. My instinct for security, my instinct for sex, and my desire to be somebody in society. And my instinct for security can be anything. I can see my tires are slightly bald and I feel insecure. Or I think somebody in the room doesn't like me. Or I see Dan closing his eyes and I'm not sure if he's falling asleep because I'm boring. I don't know. My mind can tell me things as I'm speaking. Maybe I'm not secure enough in my relationship with Dan. You know? And it can happen in the wink of an eye. And most of the time it happens below the level of consciousness. I'm not authorizing it. These thoughts just come up. 
and they take me all over the place, and they make me do and say outlandish things, and my past becomes my future, and I'm the exact same woman drunk as I am sober. What does that mean, I'm the same woman drunk as I am sober? See, I take the liquor away, and that's but a symptom. So I'm not crashing cars anyway, but I still judge you the same way. I still have the same opinions. I still like the same rock and roll songs, you know. I still love Tom Petty more than anybody else. It doesn't change. I still fold, fold my clothes the same way. I still like Mexican food with a pile of guacamole on top of everything. I still hate my fucking dad. I still think my mom's a narcissistic bitch. Nothing's changed. Liquor's gone. I'm the same. I still flip you off on the freeway if you get in front of me. I'm the same. Same everything. It's all the same. Nothing changed. And just because I come into AA and loiter around with the intent to recover doesn't mean anything changes. Just because I'm exposed to this message, just because I can be a parakeet, fuck, 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 and speak all these words. How do you know I've had a psychic change? How do you know I'm a loving person? How do you know I'm tolerant? How do you know? Maybe I'm just going to sit around here and fucking psycho babble all night long, you know? So I want to see. This for my own life. I want to see that my infantile ego and my instincts are completely warped. And what that does is that type of realization jars me to my knees. It humbles me in the most humiliating way because I have these aha moments where I realize I don't know anything anymore. I start looking at my opinions and I start looking at the way I look at you and the way I react and respond to what you say or don't say to me, the way you treat me or don't treat me, the way I need your approval or don't need your approval. And I see I'm very limited. I'm tiny, tiny little BB brain, Bob Anderson used to say, of a very, very small small, narrow mind. It's almost like a monkey. I love Jonathan Shaw. He says, I'm a primate with car keys. You know, I'm Neanderthal. But I think I'm really smart. But I'm not. I don't have the tools. I don't have sophisticated tools. I don't know how to tell you that you hurt my feelings. Could we talk about it for a few minutes? I just say, fuck you. I hate your guts. Get away from me. And that's all I have for the rest of my life. Those are my tools. We're breaking up. I can't stand it. My picker's broken. I don't know. Another dud. Another loser. You know, and I just go on and on and on and my past becomes my future and I have one cycle of turbulence after another. I'm a breeder of confusion, not harmony, always in some self-imposed crisis. So I look at what does self do with all of this? Once I can see that my mind and my ego is talking to me all the time, full of opinions that came from my entire biography and my history. Then my mind authorizes it, and I tell you things, and I say things to you, and I do things that I don't even know I'm doing. I'm unconscious, and I destroy my life. And then people say, how come you're not more loving? You should be more forgiving. It says in the prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And I start to look at myself, and I realize, I don't know how to forgive. I don't know how to be loving. You know, I'm sponsoring this really cool guy in New York right now. I love him. He's adorable. And I told him to write down his most repetitive thoughts, and I told him to call me. And one of his most repetitive thoughts was, I'm never going to be loved. And I said, that's one of mine. And I said, do you feel like you could sit next to a friend and just, I don't know, touch their hand and hold it for a few minutes. And he's like, oh, my God, hell no. And I said, how about, like, John's a really loving person, and he always kisses everyone on the cheek. How about, like, John, could you just walk up to your friends and kiss their cheeks? And be like, oh, my God. And I thought, see, I have that, too. I can't, with nine years of sobriety, just reach over and hold someone's hand. I am so uncomfortable. I'm so uncomfortable. I'm so uncomfortable. Yeah, I'm so uncomfortable kissing my friend. See, this is what I want want to talk about today because I'm still not where I'd like to be. But if I can't get honest about that, then what am I doing here? Am I just going to tell you how perfect I am? I'm scared to touch other people. I don't know about kissing somebody on the face. I don't know about hugging a little bit too long. I don't accept for Craig. I don't know about that kind of stuff. You know, that stuff makes me nervous. Why does it make me nervous? Well, we could say, you have intimacy problems. But you know what? That's just another label. How about I'm selfish and self-centered in the extreme? How about it? Driven by a hundred forms of fear. I'm so afraid. 
I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid you're going to see me. I'm afraid you're going to hate me. I'm afraid you're going to know that I've been in jail nine times for prostitution, that I have hepatitis C, that I threw my child away, that I lived in the street and turned tricks for three years. I'm afraid that you're going to judge me. I'm afraid that you're going to throw me away so I don't get too close. Don't hold my hand and I'm not kissing your face. And again, nine years of sobriety and I carry my past and my biography into the day I'm in if I don't have total awareness of what's really going on. So I look at the first half of step one, I'm powerless over alcohol. The second half of step one is my thought life is unmanageable. Because not only my outside third dimensional life, but it starts inside. The calls are coming from inside the house. It starts inside. If I don't get down, way down into the basement of my soul and see how I'm wired and see what's wrong with me, I'm never going to change. And the steps can't be a homework assignment. They have to be something that's experiential. Every day is a day I want to have a new experience with my creator, a new experience with the principles embodied in the 12 steps, a new experience with a friend, a new experience with hugging somebody or forgiving them or letting go of something that happened or changing my opinion and having an open mind about who I think they are. So what I was taught to do is just watch the thoughts that surf the waves of my brain. You want to see untreated alcoholism? Carry around a little notebook for a day and just write down your most repetitive thoughts. You'll be horrified. And you know, the neuroscientists say there are 46,000 thoughts that surf the waves of our brain. Alcoholics have four thoughts that go 46,000 times. And it's all about me. And it's all about me. And you know, here's what differs. Each alcoholic has 46 thoughts. Four thoughts that go 46,000 times, but because of your story, your thoughts are slightly different than mine. Because of your biography and your pain and what you carry in today, your thoughts are slightly different. But your thoughts hurt you the same way that they hurt me. And I'm disconnected. And I'm like, what? What did you say? And I can't quite focus on anything. And I'm thinking about where's mine. And I'm always trying to orchestrate and I'm trying to manipulate and I'm trying to make things happen my way because my mind tells me if I can just line things up or be seen in a certain way or get these certain instincts met, I'm going to be okay. And once I get the instinct met and once you like me enough, it's not enough. I still have untreated alcoholism. My mind's still talking to me. I'm still weird. I'm still crazy. I still can't hold your hand. I still can't kiss your cheek. I still can't hug you for a long time. I pat you on the back and back like this and then I go away. Still the same. Nothing really changed. So I start to look at what is this step two process that I need to come to believe that, that, that there's a power. I need to come to believe that there's a power much greater than self that can restore me. Self is a very big power. Myself is a very big power. I survived in the streets. I've had knives and guns pulled on me. I've had people try to kill me. I've seen dead bodies and overdoses. I have taken it in the ass. I've had people pull my hair, punch my eyes, give me black eyes, beat me up, call me every name in the book. I have a very strong self. You want to get in my face and untreated alcoholism? Oh, hell no. But I don't want to carry her with me everywhere. I don't want to let my bulldog out and she bites everybody in the neighborhood before I can get her back in the basement. I don't want to lead with my wound. I don't want to infect you with my disease. That part is always going to be a part of me, right, Johnny? Waiting at every woman's elbow to resume her destruction. She's always there, but that bitch has to stay in the basement on a three-foot, uh, you know, a one-foot chain, locked behind the stairs next to the hot water heater, and maybe once or twice when I really need a muscle, I might let her out for a few minutes and then push her back in. But for the most part, I want to grow a new character with no reference to the old. I want to take spiritual principles embodied in the 12 steps. So many principles. There's not just one principle behind every step. There's a principle in every single paragraph. There's so much application chock full in the big book and the 12 and 12 and Sermon on the Mount by Emmett Fox and in the Harry Tebow papers. It's a very rich, rich literature. There's so much to consider and there's so much to talk about and there's so many ways to find God. So many ways. It's it's not just one particular prayer or one particular getting on my knees. If God's infinite, then my, my creative uh, experience with God is infinite. You know, if God's a creative intelligence, then even the way I meditate or the way I pray. So it's not just in the third step prayer or the seventh step prayer or, you know, the serenity prayer. It's 
It's everywhere. It's all over the place. It's in every moment. Constantly, 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 constantly reminding myself I'm no longer running the show. Constantly means constantly. So I must get very awake. Very, 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 very awake. The process that I'm talking about is not for everybody. Some people like to just mechanically rush through the book, get some homework done, come on, come on, come on, maybe you'll have an experience, maybe you won't. I personally keep keep people in steps one, two, and three probably way longer than any other sponsor I know. Call my dad, sue me, I don't give a shit. This is the way I use it. Some people, and I don't have a problem with that either, they're like, the minute the person starts praying and getting into two and three, boom, hit them with the fourth step. You know, and I hear you, Paul. I totally, I love you. I get it. But, you know, I would rather see my sponsees talking to God more than they're talking to self. I would rather see that they're backing down and they're not in a repetitive mind function. I would rather hear Carrie call me up and say, I don't know why I just had the best day today. I don't even know why. Nothing really happened. I'm living in a sober living. I don't really even have anything. I just don't know why. I had so much peace today. And I'm like, that's right. That's what I'm fucking talking about. That's where we're going. And so, because I'm, I'm in, 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 in conscious contact with the creative intelligence, I can manifest creative intelligence, and I can maybe even uh, uh, demonstrate it and ask my sponsee, this is what I feel, this is what God calls me to do. So this process isn't for everybody. You know what? You find your way. The steps are such an organic process. The bottom line is, are you having an experience with the steps today? Are you having an experience with God today? Are you having an experience with untreated alcoholism one more time? Or are you having a new aha experience? So I look at step two, and how am I going to come to believe that there's a power greater than self? Well, in step 11, it talks about prayer and meditation, and the fox talks about petitioning. He talks about the golden key. He talks about repetitive prayer, praying things out of my system. So I start to watch my most repetitive thoughts, and I slam them, a new asshole. I'm like, you're not getting one more second of my mind and my time. And I see the fat card come in. And I see the card that says, I can't hug you. And I see the card that says, you think I'm this and that. And I see the card that says, I can't hold your hand. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I can hug you. I can kiss you. I can hold your hand. Because I'm tapping into an infinite power. Infinite. I need power. Lack of power is my dilemma. I don't need a little bit of power. I need a lot of power because my old character is an asshole. So I start to ask this power, could you help me tell Roy how much I love him? And I text Roy and I say, Roy, I love you so much. And he sends me a text back and all it says is, ugh. <laughs> and it doesn't hurt my feelings. Not one bit. And then I see him and I said, that's the weird this text. That's the weirdest text message back. And I try it a few weeks later and I send Roy a, a text message and it says I love you and all I get back is ugh. But you know what? It doesn't hurt me. It doesn't bother me. That's Roy. I do it for my own heart and I do it because I love Roy and I want to have a relationship and a friendship with Roy and it feels so good to adore him. It feels really good. It feels good to sit next to Roy and get a little bit too close and watch his face get red. It feels good to, to buy him dinner and him say no, 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 no. It starts to feel good to me. I'm not so afraid anymore. What's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. I'm having a new experience with love. I'm having an open mind and I'm having an open heart. And I'm in the application of the steps. So I'm coming to believe that there's a power because I'm asking this power to be the force for my life. I'm asking for intuitive guidance. I'm asking one moment at a time to just be with me. So I don't plan. I don't get ready for Freddie. I don't have some dialogue and I write it all down and this is what I'm going to say. I just come in with an erased slate and I'm an open book and I'm just like, well, whatever happens, happens. Let's go. And in that open space, the nothingness isn't nothingness. It's an enormous force of creative intelligence. And it's waiting there to manifest through my words and through my heart and through my life. It's waiting to burst out through me into the third dimensional world. It's waiting to forgive. It's waiting to love. It's waiting to have a new moment. It's waiting there. Nothing isn't nothing. You know, I was looking at some crazy stuff with the universe the other day, and the scientist said one thing. I'm not going to take you way out there, but one thing that really hit me. He said the whole entire universal cosmic thing is just this one big connected whoom, and it keeps growing and growing. 
So if I'm connected to that, I'm fucking connected to this monstrous thing. It is so big. And then, you want to hear about my problems or my little story? They just didn't say hi to me. Who I said, ugh, in my text message, he doesn't love me. I'm not getting any recognition. I don't know how to kiss people on the cheek. I have hepatitis C. I think everybody's probably afraid of a virus. Fuck that shit. I want to have a good life. I want to have a new experience. I want to enjoy myself. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. I'm 53. You know, I want to have a good experience. And God makes that possible. God makes that possible by allowing life to just unfold in front of me without any preconceived ideas, without any opinions. And in step three, I make a decision to turn my will and my thought life over to the care of this power. Not one. Every single moment of every single day. And if you think I do this thing perfectly, you are out of your mind. I can play ping pong with self and God all day long. I can have Star Wars in my head. You just give me one good ego show where I think I need to tell somebody, and it's on. You know, and I have to fight the thing down again over and over. There's spiritual warfare in my head. But I can tell you this, I've never had so much peace in my whole life. And I'm not interested so much in what you think about me anymore. I am interested in what I can bring and pack into the stream of life and give to other people. I am interested in forgiveness. I am interested in being a demonstration of a woman who lives by the 12 steps. I'm not a liar or cheat and a thief today. I can tell you one thing. You will not catch me in a lie. Not one single lie will you catch coming out of my mouth. I do not lie. I do not steal. I do not cheat. I haven't taken anything that doesn't belong to me in so many years. And that makes such a clean, clean feeling inside of me. I feel good every day. I'm not that story. I'm not all that stuff. I'm an empty vessel for God to fill. But in one split second, self can come back in, lift its leg, and pee on my tree, and poof, I get what I always get. So I don't want to take up any more time. Those are the first three steps in an organic process for me. There's so much more to talk about in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's an amazing program. It's a beautiful program. It's a life-giving program. It's a transformational program. And if you're not having an experience, talk to your creator and ask him for a new experience. Thank you so much for letting me share. <laughs> Oh, we got the seventh tradition, and this meeting's expensive. If you can be really generous, that's cool. If you don't have any money, whatever. But we like fives in the basket. We like them a lot. Twenties are great. So, does somebody want to share or ask a question? Billy. Okay. So, you talked about Hi, Billy. And it creates space for God and your life. Yeah, I can. So, um, for me, I'm going to talk about my own experience with it. So, I stopped using my mental intelligence. <laughs> But the heart has another intelligence, and the heart's really smart. And you know, like, you see somebody across the room, and you're like, oh, I have a creepy feeling. And it wasn't even a thought. Or you see somebody, and you go, I have a nice feeling. I like that person. Well, those are just a very minuscule uh, example of what the heart can know. So the heart has brain cells. And that's where the soul lives, and that's where God lives. So if I can get away from my stories and all of my ideas and be in an unknowing place, there's no such thing as unknown. The heart wakes up, the God consciousness wakes up, and a fucking genius inside of my heart wakes up. And I don't know why everybody said they hate so-and-so, and I don't know, I like them. Something about him I like. I want to go over and give that person a hug. I don't even know why, I just do. And I get driven by a different kind of force, completely different kind of force. And I can sit in quiet, and I can contemplate, and I can get really high, exalted answers unbelievable answers like where did that come from or an idea or a creative idea like wow that is just the craziest thing how did I ever have that and it's because I backed down and I got quiet enough for the smart part to be able to spark up and say something so it's not really out there it's in here it's inside of me Deep down inside of every man woman and child is the fundamental idea of God so when I pray even 
I don't push my energy outward. I really go in like a tortoise into his shell. I go way in. I don't want the third dimensional world to touch me. I go in, into the secret place like Emmett Fox says, and I ask God deep down inside of me, and the great reality starts to show itself. Thanks for the question. Back there, David. Hi, David. Hi, David. Yeah, you know, we have to get into action, and so I am invested in the efforts business, and I'm not invested in the results. And the efforts business is I'm in a continuous state of awareness and prayer. So you really want to pay attention to the most repetitive stories, um, especially if they're really intertwined with um, survival is a big one for people. I'm not going to make it is one of the biggest stories, okay? So if you know now that your most repetitive thought is I'm not going to make it, every single time Mr. I'm not going to make it puts his hat on and starts yelling at you from the basement, you go, ah, 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 turbo. God, can you please be with me? Look at Mr. I'm not going to make it just woke up. And it puts a buffer between Mr. I'm not going to make it and the present moment. And so that buffer, don't think of it as some small minuscule thing. It's just enough for the hamster not to get on the wheel and make you crazy. But if you talk to Mr. I'm going to make it for 30 seconds, he might be running for the rest of the day, and now you're captured by self, and there's no way to get the hamster off the meal with wheel without a tremendous amount of backing down and prayer and prayer and prayer. So I don't let them on there. But in the beginning, I'm telling you, dude, it was killing me. I would be on the floor crying all the time. God, you've got to protect me from my mind. And I was in alcoholism more than I wasn't, and then I'd have huge periods of relief, and I'd think, oh, I got it. And then it would all go away, and my peace would be gone again. I mean, it's just really, it's a process, and it's a way of life. And even the pain, I've come to just welcome it, because it is the touchstone to spiritual progress. I don't get nirvana all the time. Sometimes I suffer. Sometimes people really bother me. People are hell for me. They still are. My skin's very thin. I can hate in a minute and wish you were dead and have a baseball bat for your kneecaps and a gas can for your house. You know, I, I'm really, I, that's, what, that, that's, that's who I am in untreated alcoholism, and I just, I don't like it. It's so painful for me to be in that place. Anyway, thanks for the question. Shelly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I think they've appeared before I even crack the book open? No. It's been my experience that those characteristics that you were talking about is just one that they have to go over. Uh-huh. Do you think that they are in the treatment of alcoholic phenomenon? Probably. Yeah, I mean, Bill Wilson was such a coxman and thinking he's all that and the freaking, you know, stock market and we'll just move somewhere else and I'll rip you off, Lois, and your fucking family too and I don't need to work and bathtub gin. And, yeah, what a bunch of arrogant bullshit that was. <laughs> For real, right? But you said, you know, sometimes, you know, we're racism wasn't happening. Yeah. And all those you say it. You share it. You do it. Sometimes we're more gracious and more demand. Fire it up. Fire it up. Gracious of the nanny. We try to arrange the show to suit ourselves. Nice. But the light doesn't come off. The actors in the lighting are not right. Seem to be the same stuff you talk about in time. Same. 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 Just a different line. Same character. Same. Thank you so much for your share. Right there. Hi, Hi, Hi Quinn. Um, Esther, thank you for your share. I, uh, Totally related, especially with the big part of like when people, you know, express love to you and like how, for me, like nothing will make me cringe more than when someone compliments me. Like they can insult me and that's fine, but like, like when I get compliment, it's like, I don't know what to do. I freeze, I panic. And, um, you know, it's like I'm, I'm pretty new to sobriety and like with this, it comes like some awareness. And I, I just got a three out where it was really focused on awareness. And now I'm realizing just how crazy my thoughts are because I'm actually paying attention to them before I just, you know, allow them to dictate my actions uh, without really paying attention to them. And my question
question is like I heard your share, it's like you have nine years and so it seems like you still constantly are, are taking this contrary action and it's like you know, the one hope I had is in the book who talks about becoming intuitive thought. You know, you do this until it becomes intuitive thought. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'll just keep checking myself. Because I, I always realize a little bit afterwards, like, oh, I just fucked up there, you know. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I was like, yeah, I would realize like four seconds earlier, I was realizing the whole thing. And, you know, so does it get easier? Oh my god, so much easier. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. I very rarely get really disturbed. I get mildly disturbed and I can get back into treated bill bad. I can get disturbed for about 30 minutes, and I mean fuming, and then it's all over. It's over. I don't have whole days of untreated alcoholism. I haven't woken up in hell in so long. I haven't gone to sleep in hell in so long. I haven't chewed somebody a new bunghole in fucking forever. Um, yeah. But, you know, also, I keep that stuff out there. I don't let it get all over me. I don't let people in life infect me. When I feel that you're so toxic, that you're too close to my space, I'm just like, whoa, 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 God, can you please make my skin thicker? You know, it's interesting because I was watching something that the Dalai Lama said recently, and he said, we all build our immune system because we don't want all these pathogens and bugs and everything, but so few people take the spirit and try to build an outer immune system. This is what we need. And I'm like, duh, that's it. You know, so I need to become more immune. And the reason why you can't take a compliment is because of your pathology, and I already know, I know, your mom and dad never told you they loved you and they didn't compliment you, because people and children that were nurtured can totally, my daughter, she loves a compliment, she just smiles and says, thank you, and she's so open, and you say it, because I complimented her her whole life, I don't know what to do, you call me an a-hole or a c-u-n-t, and it's like, I don't know how to fucking respond to that, but I don't know how to do it, because we weren't nurtured, so now here we are in grown-up earth suits with a five-year-old infantile ego figuring out how to be gracious and thankful when somebody says something kind to us. God makes that possible. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Right there, Joseph. Joseph, I get confused after all the time in regards to trying to live my life and trying to decide whether I'm putting my will in into the picture and saying, saying what's God's will. You know what I mean? And then and I get so angry, so it can't be God's will. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, and I, it's like I try to change, I try a, a, a decision, and, and, I, and I found out that this guy told me there was no appeal process, and then I found out there was, and I'm, my mind just said, that stupid SOB lying son of a bitch, and I was just like, I'll show him, I'll go over his head, and then on and on and on it went, and then, um, you know, and I just kept on going up the food chain. I wasn't letting it go. And the next person I could talk to after the guy I talked to would be Obama. You know, I'm sorry, that's how far I brought it up. And I was like, this is crazy. You know, and uh, I just gave up. I just gave up. So I don't know what to do. Like, somebody told me this picture, a chair, and a bus, and you're not driving. And, uh, and I, 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 that's where I need to be. And I, I've been trying that all day long. This picture. George Burns in, the, in this chair, and I'm sitting on the back with a helmet on because I don't know what the hell to do. Right. I don't know what to do, and I'm, I'm, I'm freaking out. And I'm just uh, freaking out. I know what my normal response is to frustration. No. Okay. So what I'm hearing is that. Um, you're on your muscle because you got to have something a certain way. And your mind is telling you when you get that thing, you're finally going to be okay. And you are so driven to get that thing because you're finally going to be okay. And I'm going to tell you right now. Probably not going to be okay. Probably not because you have untreated alcoholism. So maybe, just maybe, you don't need to go straight through the front door. Maybe God's going to open the chimney or a window or something else. Maybe, just maybe, it's not time to do that. But for me to bombard something with my will and to just see square pegs into round holes, I'm so tired of drinking that Kool-Aid. I just don't even want. I don't. And, you know, sometimes God does show me to really fight for something. Like this meeting, you know, I felt really passionate about it when everybody left. I'm like, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not going. But other things, no. I'm just not willing to. And it's between you and your creator. You know, some people might... Fight in court for something for 10 years with God. But hopefully it would look like 
they're in the effort, they stay out of the results, and they put their head on their pillow every night, and they don't have a big story. And they get up the next day, and they do it again, and they lay another brick, and another brick, and they call another person, and they make another thing, and another appearance, and they write down another piece of paper. But they don't look at the, the results. They don't look at the big picture. They don't future surf. Because alcoholism is in the resentments of the past and the fear of the future. And your mind's telling you, I'm afraid of the future. I'm not going to have something and then I'm going to be destroyed. I'm gonna, something's going to be taken away, or I'm not going to get something I want. And it's not true. You know what? You're a beautiful guy, and such a demonstration of AA. I'm honestly so impressed with you. You're here every week. You take commitments. You help people. You share and share and share until the cows come home. You're awesome. I don't know what it is, but I know that God's working in your life. You're such a demonstration to me. So I don't know what the deal is, but there's got to be another window. There's got to be another door. Don't worry, Alcatraz, you'll get out. Okay. Sheldon. Hi, Sheldon. Good to see you. Um, you know, uh, I, I see the God in all of this. I see the God in, in, in every piece of literature ever written about God. I see the, I see the, uh, the uh, possibility that all of those things can manifest in my life. And, and it tells me in the book to, to lay aside prejudice against the religious ideas mm-hmm. and um, it, it, content prior to investigation. And I, and I live that way. I live that way. I try to see the God in everything and all of the uh, uh, all the connections. You know, it's like uh, you talk about it, you know, and, and that we can get free of this kind of thinking, that we can get onto a higher plane of thinking, which is promised to us. It's totally promised to us. So we can get placed on a much higher plane with our thinking and then that God is doing for us what we can't do for ourselves, and that, that that becomes automatic without any effort on my part. That means I don't have to do anything. That this is I've been doing this for so long that God has taken over. In the third step, I turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood it. And when that happens, my life is no longer any of my business, and I gave it all into the care of God, and God is running my life. So you know what what would have happened if that morning this wife died that I didn't. I wake up and find my day, and I did it in the of upon awakening. And I ask God to divorce me from selfish and self seeking motives. And I go throughout my day pausing when that was really doubtful. You were talking about so eloquently that you do that. You pause and you watch. And you watch your behavior as you're going through the day, and God makes that possible. I can't do that at all, right? There's no way in the world that I can make, I can watch my day and be successful. I can't do that. I need God in my life. So I come home and my wife is drowning in the bathtub. What was my constant thought? We talk about constant thought, constant thought of others, constant thought of God. Thy will be done, not mine. It tells us how our thinking is going to be rearranged. And, and, I, and in that moment, I thought, well, what did you want me to do now? And that was the constant thought. All through my wife's death for many, many years, what do you want me to do now? Where do you want me to be? What do you want me to be? And uh, not what do you want me to do, but what do you want me to be? How do you want me to be? You want me to be loving, kind, tolerant. You want me to be angry now? I'll be angry now. It's up to God. God is the one that directs me, guides my thinking. And there are times that I need to be angry, that people need to see that I am a human and that I am uh, uh, not a saint. But I do claim my spiritual progress. I do progress spiritually, and I'm getting better and better every day. And then I'm moving towards God, and I'm not moving towards the thing anymore. It's just not happening. So the language of the heart is very powerful. It's in everything. If you look at it, and you open your mind, and you don't block it off from anything, all the literature, because every piece of spiritual, uh, you know, the Dalai Lama to the Koran, to all of those things, all have the same message that you have to turn to God for the power to guide and direct. It's about love and power. And so just love it. And you think it. Thanks, Sheldon. The young lady right there from Temecula. Hi. Um, for me, the third dimension is uh, all the concrete stuff. It's my car, my bank account, the traffic. And the fourth dimension for me is more, uh, it's a feeling thing. And it's a perception thing, and it's an experiential thing where I can be in this crazy world. You know, like, 
God forbid this ever happens, I hope it doesn't, but I could be diagnosed with cancer, my daughter could be killed in a horrible accident, my house could burn down, and I could lose the capacity to work. And somehow, if I remained with God, I remain in a fourth dimensional state of mind, and I'm taken care of, and those things don't bother me, just like Sheldon was saying when his wife passed away. What motivated him to just get up? and get back on his program and talk to his creator. And so that's what I'm looking for, is that experience where the third dimension isn't kicking my ass all along the way. I didn't get the car, I didn't get the job, they talking shit about me. I'm not so interested in all those little egoic animal maneuvers. I'm more interested in being open and receptive with my heart open, and I'm feeling my way through the world this way instead of with my intellect. That doesn't mean I give all my money away. That doesn't mean I'm a doormat. That doesn't mean when you treat me like shit five times in a row that I don't just walk away from you. That's not what that means. It means that I have an experience with my heart, and I have an experience with backing down, and I have an experience with grace, and I have an experience with God speaking through me. That's what it is for me, and everybody's different. You know, people like Matthew, I'm sure, because he's a musician, he just feels creativity and music blowing through his veins. I'm not a musician. There's no fourth-dimensional music thing for me at all. You know, it comes through my words, or, or it comes through my relationship with my daughter. And so for everyone, there's a different avenue. God expresses himself infinitely through people, but it's that experiential place for me. I think we could have one more share and then wrap it up. Carlton. So I've heard big groups of both first diagnosis as I'm all his needs and um a lot of things of a couple years back I was watching part of episodes of that show so I heard three nights of Dr. Pinsky. And I remember Dr. Robin was on the show and Dr. Pinsky kinda let this guy know that he was out of office. He gave him his dribble as if evidence and um and Dad and Robin didn't want to accept that. And, and I spoke at the time with my um, sponsor, and he, he was a sergeant that was not Dr. Pitts' place to diagnose um, Dad and Robin because, as I said, the only person that can diagnose me is himself. So, can you speak to that as far as um, somebody in the profession of um, in medicine? Diagnosing someone as an alcoholic? <laughs> Well, you spot it, you got it, but it's not me to sit there and shit it down somebody's throat. They don't want to admit they're an alcoholic. Good. Keep what you got, man. See, you wouldn't want to be you. Have a nice life. You know? <laughs> you want what I have? Come on to my side of the street. You don't? I don't care. If your life's not important to you, it ain't important to me. If your life's important to you, I'm going to make your life important to me. That's it. That's all I got. I don't know. Anyway, that's all we got for tonight. Thank you guys for coming. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.